So it's my pleasure and my privilege to be introducing our speaker tonight, and I'm really excited to be introducing her to you. Our speaker, Ness Wilson, epitomizes what we really stand for at Wildfires when she and her then husband-to-be, uh, Rich, were students at Loughborough University back in the 90s, they saw an outpouring of the spirit on their campus, so much so that they saw, I was about to say hundreds, I don't know, was it hundreds of students? Many, many students come to Jesus, so much so that Ness realized, I can't just leave it at this, I need to plant a church. So Ness then planted a church straight out of being a student at uni herself and, and then started an incredible church called Open Heaven, which then has planted and, and now has, has become one of the most well-respected churches. Ness is now Ness now leads the pioneer network of churches. <laughs> And she's just the mo one of the most incredible women leaders I know. She's on the, the Wildfires team, and she and Rich are just incredible leaders. Two years ago, their talk was one of the most incredible talks on suffering. I don't know if you heard it, but it was certainly one of the most powerful talks on suffering I think I've ever heard. Ness is an incredible and most powerful, one of the most senior women leaders in our nation. And I'm thrilled that we've got her to open the conference and speak to us tonight. So would you open your ears and open your hearts to Ness Wilson. Well, hello, Wildfires. It's uh, such a privilege to be speaking on this first night of Wildfires, where we are gathering together in this field for the next few days. Why don't we say it together? Why are we here to contend for another great awakening? That's the cause, that's the purpose, that is the mission. And uh, this festival started seven years ago, as Pete says, and a lot has happened and a lot has changed in seven years, globally, nationally, and for many of us personally. My, uh, I feel a different person to seven years ago. Many of us, we bear a few more scars. Our faith has been tested and our longing for awakening has deepened. So in all of that, this particular wildfires, at this particular point in August 2024, I feel I can dare to say, perhaps with a whisper, that what we have been anticipating and what we have been longing for, we are now beginning to experience. I do believe that we are in the grip of a slow awakening and there is no going back. In fact, would you please just raise a hand uh, wherever you are in the tent, if you also feel and sense that you have seen something shift since the last wildfires in May 23. Perhaps it's the level of spiritual hunger that you've seen evident in the, the non-Christians around you. Perhaps it's the number of people who are becoming Christians. Perhaps um, it's the kind of dramatic stories that you're hearing as people are encountering Christ. If you feel that you've seen that kind of change, that shift, then please would you raise a hand. So if you look around this tent, I do believe that something is happening and we don't do unreality here at wildfires but this is real and something has begun and it's often the way 
in spiritual awakenings that it is the young who are leading the way. It's the younger generation who are turning to God first. And when they turn to God, they are wholehearted. I've heard it said that Generation Z stands for Generation Zeal. There's something that is happening in the younger generation. Perhaps they're so utterly convinced that society has sold them a lie. Secularism has failed them. It just doesn't work. They're at the sharp end of an ideology that's seen God pushed to the very edges. And it's wreaked havoc and disorder and pain. And so there's this desire, there's this hunger, there's this deep desperation for a better story. A story where life actually works and families flourish and society functions well. I'm sure, like many of you, locally for us, we have seen a marked increase, particularly in the under 25s who are becoming Christians and more dramatic encounters with the living Jesus, breaking into some very dark and desperate situations, seeing lives turned around. The testimonies at our baptisms over the last 12 months have been of a different order. It's like Jesus has just plucked people out of dark and desperate situations. The lostness that people have been rescued from is deeper and darker with stories of serious addictions and oppression, occult depression, and the foulness of being found by Christ is even more glorious, is even more joyful, is even more liberating. One particular thing that we've seen with the younger generation that has been so fascinating and completely Holy Spirit orchestrated is a desire among seekers, searchers, those who wouldn't yet say that they follow Jesus, to read the Bible. One of our congregations is called OH1. It meets in the student union on campus every Sunday during term time on a Sunday afternoon. It's made up mainly of 18s to 30s. There's about 100 of them. They meet in a place called the lounge, and two sides of the venue is made up of windows. So it means that people who are in the students' union in the cafe area having coffees or pizza, they can look in, they can see, and they can hear in. And very often, people have always just kind of wandered in a little bit at the back. The doors are open. There's always a few people just hanging about. And people kind of wander in and maybe stay around for a bit, you know, listen to the worship, then wander out again. But what began to happen in October was something that hadn't happened before. It wasn't planned. It wasn't anticipated. It wasn't our normal. Students who were stopping by just to listen in were then asking for a Bible. Now, we always had, like on the welcome table, you know, a few Bibles that would be there for anyone who maybe hadn't got one. But this was different. People were coming in and saying, I really feel like I want to read the Bible. I'm not a Christian. Uh, I don't really know where to go, where to get one. Or some people had gone to charity shops and had bought Bibles, you know, like the King James Version, and then were struggling to understand them. And so they were coming in and uh, we were giving away these Bibles and a few Bible reading plans. So we had to buy more because they all went, but we, I think we were a bit slow on the uptake because, you know, we just kind of realized, oh, well, this kind of stock of Bibles is going down. So there was a Black Friday deal in November, so bought a whole lot more and kept on giving them away. Anyway, what started in October has continued like a steady stream. And by the end of the academic year, we realized we'd given out 75 Bibles to people who are on a journey to faith. And that has not been a human strategy. There's not been like a planning meeting. It's something that God has been doing. So we're kind of waking up to it. We're switching on to it. And so now when people are wanting Bibles, offering, would you want to meet up with someone? so that actually you can talk about what you're reading. We can help to perhaps explain it. We've just discovered the, the, uh, some of the few questions from the disciple-making movements, Discovery Bible Study, very easy, very simple, like three questions that apply to any passage that you're reading. What does this show you about God? What does this show you about me, and what must I do in the light of it? And then a, a few months ago in April, I was at a meal with a load of uh, 
women from church, and I was sitting next to a young woman from OH1. I'd never met her before, and I could tell within the first few minutes that she was pretty new to the whole kind of church and faith thing. And again, she started telling me about the Bible. For her, she was brought up in a family where she was actually given verses to argue against Christians. So that was her first exposure to the Bible. But then just just back in December, a few Bible verses started popping up on her social media feed. And she began to think, you know what? As I read these Bible verses on this social media feed, I'm starting to feel quite peaceful. I, there's something good that's happening as I'm reading these verses. She, she, she then decided to go and buy a Bible. So she went to buy a Bible and started reading the Bible in January. And when I met her in April, she had read the Bible every single day. She had started coming to church and she was ringing her mom after saying, mom, everything you've told me about church is wrong. I'm really enjoying it. The, the, the talks are really relevant. The, the music is great. And I feel like something's really changing inside of me. Anyway, she then decided to become a Christian. She got baptized in May, and such is the change that now her mom wants to come and visit her and come to church, and she is actually here at Wildfires volunteering. <laughs> and that's just, that's just one story amongst many. Something is happening. And that something creates hunger and faith for more. You know, awakening never randomly just happens. It comes when the bride of Christ longs for and contends for and prays for and prepares for the bridegroom. And that's certainly what I'm seeing in some of the churches that I'm connecting with and, and what we're seeing locally. There is just a hunger. I know that's many churches that are drawn to wildfires. I've got a hunger for more of God. There's more lingering in his presence. More churches are having kind of monthly worship nights. There's more of a desire to push into prayer. We've had a student prayer meeting happening at 8 a.m. every morning since January. That means no lie-ins for students. Now that is a sign of revival. So there's more pushing into worship, there's more pushing into prayer, and there's more of a desire for inward transformation, a kind of, to use a quote, holiness that hurts the eyes. So I felt God uh, just gave me a passage for tonight that I want to invite you to look up with me. It's Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. If you've got your Bibles talking about what God is doing uh, amongst folks, then please do get your Bible out. It'd be really good for us to actually dig into the Word of God together or get it up on your phones. We're looking at Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. Okay, Luke chapter 3, 1 to 16. So follow this with me. This is in the NIV version. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Tetrarch, Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitus, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked paths shall become straight and rough ways smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit 
in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what shall we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly. That's like us, isn't it? Waiting expectantly. We're all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The one who brings fire is coming and we had better get ready. I guess I was drawn to this passage as I was thinking about it because I kind of see wildfires as the kind of John the Baptist of the different summer festivals. There's something that comes out of us. It's because of kind of how how we formed, I guess, of a voice calling out. At times it's felt in the wilderness, prepare for the way of the Lord. Make the path straight. That's what our cry, our cause has been. We've gathered over these seven years because something is stirring in our hearts. There's a desperation. God, there has to be more. Our eyes have seen a cloud the size of a man's hand. Our ears have been attuned to the words of the prophets that have been saying, like Jim LaFoon, get ready, get prepared. The king is coming. Clear the ground and roll out the red carpet. And that's something of what wildfires is about, clearing the ground, rolling out the red carpet, ready for the bridegroom to come. So let's dig into the passage just a little. Verses one and two obviously sets the historical scene, describing four rulers, both political and religious. And to be honest, I won't go into all the details. It's a terrible combination of leaders on the world scene at that time. So, but it is at that very time when the future looked bleak, when things looked hopeless, when things seemed out of God's control. It's at that time, it's at that moment that God behind the scenes is getting ready to come in quite a dramatic way. God was on the move. And verse two says, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. There's two things about that. Firstly, there'd been a 400 year gap of any kind of visible God activity. 400 years, but something was happening again after a very long wait. And that's where we're at, isn't it? Something is happening again after a very long wait. And then secondly, John came out of the desert place. He came out of the wilderness, a dry and a barren place. And I know from experience that often our deepest connection, our revelation of how much we need God comes in the desert place, comes in the trial, in the hardship, in those times of suffering. I do believe there is a spiritual authority that can only come out of the wilderness times when all we can do is surrender 
because life doesn't make sense anymore. Maybe our dreams are shattered. And all we can do is trust. And I want to say to some of you who've maybe arrived here in that place, you know you're in that desert place. You're in that wilderness. That it's okay for the only strategy, in fact, the very best strategy is the one of surrender, the one of trust. Corrie Tim Boom famously said that when you're on a train and it goes into a tunnel and it all goes dark, that is not the time to jump off the train. That is the time to sit tight and trust the driver. That when we're in those hard times, those desert times, there's a deepening that goes on, a childlike trust, a dependence, where you say with a, with a sigh, I don't understand, but you're God and I'm not. I do know you are good and loving and faithful and you are with me in this. And then from the place of barrenness, the place of surrender, the place of desert, something emerges that is refined and powerful. And that's what we see coming from John the Baptist. He's coming out of that desert place with power. So he comes, verse three, out of the wilderness, and it says in the text, he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The word of God had summoned John and then commissioned John. And that's what we're praying for here. There's something that's gonna happen in these few days where it's like God summons us and commissions us with the word of God to go out of here with fire and with power, with contagious wildfire. John left the secluded, the hidden, the safe life of the desert and in a sense became conspicuous knowing that there was going to be a cost to pay. And I guess I just want to say to some of you that there's gonna be a call that will come from God. And you're gonna know there's gonna be a cost to pay for that call, but he will give you what you need because he will always equip those that he calls. There will be a courage that will be given to you. Incidentally, I find it fascinating that John went into the outdoor spaces and you know, there is something about true awakening that cannot stay within the church walls. One of the things that, uh, that we again have just begun to see uh, more recently over this last season is uh, one of our student small groups has been regularly worshiping outside of McDonald's on a small group night and chatting to people in the town center. One of the goals of our student worker for this coming year is that we're gonna baptize some new Christians in the fountain, which is essentially in the middle of a big green space outdoors right next to the students' union. When that happens, that is gonna cause a stir. You know, when Wesley started preaching, it, God quickly moved him into outdoor spaces in order for the gospel to reach so many of the crowds with, the, with, the, with who Jesus is. I wonder whether there's something that's gonna be happening in this coming season. Maybe some of you worship leaders will start to feel called. I've gotta take this into the outdoor spaces. So John was outdoors. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this was unprecedented. You know, he was preaching baptism for Jewish people. That didn't happen. It was for those who were God-fearers who wanted to convert into Judaism. Not for Jewish people, God's chosen people. It was unheard of. But what's going on here is John is saying, family ties, ancestry, spiritual capital, it's not enough. Because preparing for the Lord to come is about the heart. 
It's about undivided, fully devoted hearts. And that is what baptism was signifying, a baptism of repentance. And so John was performing the work of preparation for the Lord to come by appealing for human hearts to turn fully away from the things that would distract and trap and pull them down and turn fully to God. Luke obviously sees these words as a fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way, make the path straight, get rid of everything, every obstacle, every bit of rubbish that could hinder the coming of the king. It's like the spiritual equivalent of the ancient practice where people would go ahead of a visit of the king and literally level out the paths, fill in the potholes, get rid of rubbish, get rid of obstacles. What's going on here is the spiritual equivalent of, if you like, being the kind of the street cleaners, getting it ready for an encounter. And One of the signs of spiritual awakening, I think, is a fresh sensitivity to the things that get in the way, which obviously the Bible calls sin. And I've been really challenged recently by, I guess, the blatant ownership of sin that new Christians are so readily talking about. You know, I, we planted open heaven, as Sammy was saying, back in the early 90s, and it was like at the height of the seeker-sensitive movement, and it was all about, you know, preaching uplifting messages and upbeat music and keep it really exciting. And it's like, I'm just really struck by the way that people who are coming to Christ at the moment are just being so honest about about the sin that's got in the way. We've got one young man here who's come with us, uh, with our group from church, who's come from a Hindu family. And um, this was just a few weeks ago in our back garden. I've got permission to, to, to tell this story. He just, from a Hindu family, was just drawn to Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus in his room. And this is the way that he phrased it. He said, it was both the worst day and the best day of my life. The worst day because I suddenly realized the state of my heart and the best day because of the glorious freedom that I encountered. Real repentance, the repentance that John is talking about leads to joy and leads to freedom. There's something about getting clean and staying clean in the presence of God that is so, so good for us. It's what we're created for. So as John is preaching the message of repentance, what we see in the passage is it provokes two things. One is hunger and one is hostility. Matthew tells us that it's the, uh, the religious leaders who get hostile and, and come towards John with a suspicion and scrutiny. And he obviously replies, you brood of vipers. And I think there's probably going to be something of those dual reactions that we're going to be seeing in our awakening as well. Hunger, you know, unprecedented spiritual hunger but we will also see some hostility. And that's obviously kind of, it's normal, isn't it? If you think about the early church, if you think about anywhere in the world where there are awakenings happening, it's just perhaps in this country, we've not been so used to it. But it's something for us to be prepared for. And so looking further on in this passage, I think there's three keys for us at this time. Number one, look at verse eight. John says to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, repentance is not a single act. It's a way of life. Number two, verses 11 to 14, repentance as a way of life affects our generosity and our relationships. Repentance and forgiveness lead to communities of grace. And then number three, 
verses 15 and 16. Leaders for the awakening know that it is all about Jesus. So, very quickly, producing fruit in keeping with repentance. One of the things that we've seen, I know that it's right across this room in so many of the churches that are represented here, is there's been so much more kind of calls to repentance. And people have come, haven't they, and maybe knelt at a cross or knelt at an altar rail. That's something that we've been seeing. However, John's definition of repentance is insightful because if we only repent with our lips without repenting with our lives, our conscience will become dull. So it's about getting clean and staying clean. And we need, friends, we need ongoing accountability. All of us need that. It was one of the genius strokes of Wesley that as he began to steward the last great awakening, he grouped people into small groups and bands. And one of, one of the... the um, the common themes of, of gathering together was openness, honesty, and accountability with questions like, how is it with your soul, and what do you need to confess? And there's something, I believe, about this awakening where we need to really ask ourselves, who in our lives are we accountable to? And that requires humility, doesn't it, to tell on ourselves there's a phrase that I heard recently that I thought was really good in terms of the times we're coming into, and it's this, the door is in the floor. That there's something about humility and ongoing accountability that we need to embrace. And then number two, repentance as a way of life affects our relationships. It is not a private, personal, individualistic thing. It has a different but relevant outworking for every person, every profession, and every position in society. Read with me verses 10 to 14. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. The soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Every example here affects relationships, particularly relationships between the oppressors, that's the tax collectors and the soldiers, and the oppressed. Repentance and redemption is available to all. There is a connection between having a culture where repentance is a way of life, which leads to a community of grace. And don't we need that in our churches and our cultures? When we are quick to repent, we are quick to forgive. The two go hand in hand. Again, they both require a humility. The door is in the floor. The opposite of being quick to repent and quick to forgive is... Uh, taking offense. And friends, offense is not a virtue. As we mature, we become less concerned by what offends us and more acutely concerned with what offends God. Awakening and relational grace go hand in hand. And a big part of being a community of grace is praying for each other. Let me read you a quote from Bonhoeffer. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. His face, that may have been strange and intolerable to me, is transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died, the face of a forgiven sinner. So a repentance as a way of life leads to a community of grace. And then lastly, verses 15 and 16, leaders of an awakening know it's all about Jesus. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, John was the focus of the people's attention and Jesus was the focus of John's attention. John, if you like, was the equivalent of a celebrity pastor and he takes himself off that pedestal and he points people to Jesus and that's the best kind of leader and that's the kind of leader that we are going to need for this awakening. Leaders in an awakening will refuse the honor that belongs to Christ. It's human nature, isn't it, that we kind of would prefer to be served rather than serve, to be honored rather than honor. But true servant leaders know it is always about Jesus. It's never for them. It's never about them. This is a Jesus movement. Some of you might have seen the film, the documentary, The, the, uh, the Jesus Revolution. It's a Jesus movement. This is not about some great new effective evangelism programs that are going to see more fruit. It's a Jesus movement. It's because Jesus is being exalted. It's because Jesus is being glorified. It's because people who are in dark and desperate situations are meeting with the living, risen, ascended, glorified Jesus. And it is a Jesus movement. And that's what wildfires is all about. Less of us and more of him. And that's the kind of leaders that we need. We desperately need those kinds of leaders. Trust needs to be rebuilt into leadership. And it's only truly servant leaders that will allow trust to be rebuilt. Again, the door is in the floor. The door is in the floor when it comes to Humility, openness, honesty, accountability, letting people in. The door is in the floor when it comes to being a community of grace. That our default is to pour grace and to cover over others' weaknesses and sins, not to get offended. And the door is in the floor when it comes to true leadership. And so I do believe there are some keys in this passage for us that we need to get right with God We need to clear the relational obstacles out the way. And we need to be, anyone who knows they're called to leadership knows this is of a different order of laying our lives down so that he gets exalted. We want to roll the red carpet out so that King Jesus, King Jesus is coming and we had better get ready. So friends, we've just got a little bit of time before I know um, children need to be collected. We've got a bit of time to worship and respond. There's two things that I just felt. One around this whole thing of some people knowing in order to prepare the way that there's something in their hearts that they need to get They need to get clean and they need to get cleared out the way in order that they can fully enter into all that the Spirit of God wants to do in them these few days. You might, you maybe have come here knowing there's this, there's this thing that does not fit with who you are. You know, we are glorious creatures in the sight of God. But there are some things that, 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 that hang on to us that do not fit with who we are. And in that as well, I just thought there's some people that you perhaps have been in this pattern of the kind of same old thing keeps tripping you up. And you know in order to get free today, tonight, you want to make a stand, you're going to embrace accountability. This is, going, this is going to the next level. This is not just a one-off, I need to get right with God. This is, I am going to be accountable about this. There may even be somebody here that you just want to say, I need to chat to you. We need to go out and have a walk around the field because I need to confess some stuff and I need to give you permission to ask me the difficult questions in an ongoing, accountable, open, honest friendship. So there's that first thing of people just wanting to get clean and right before God. But you might even want to come forward with somebody to say, I'm going to be accountable to this person. And then the other thing is for those of you who know that you're called to be leaders in this time of awakening and that you need to go to the next level of humility. The door is in the floor. It's not about us. It's all about him. And we often start off really well-meaning in our journey of leadership. But over time, 
little bits of pride can creep in. So those two things, maybe if the worship band could come up and you'll know if it's you that needs to just do some business with God. If there's something you think, just want to get rid of it, don't want this hanging on, doesn't fit with who I am anymore, then please just come forward. You can kneel at the front. If you've got somebody as well that you just want to be accountable to, then, uh, then bring, bring them forward. And then leaders marked by humility.